thank you for having me. We're going to be chatting about confidently parenting through the pandemic. And the words confidently and parenting and pandemic might seem completely foreign and very difficult to put in the same sentence. Um, but we're going to do it and we're going to have a look because it is possible. So let's leap on right ahead. So what we're going to be doing tonight, if I can just please ask you to put everybody to put your um, mics on mute if they're not, because obviously it just creates a lot of interference. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be drawing on some brilliant minds. So what I'm going to be talking to you about, we're going to be looking at um, some of some Dan Siegel, Bruce Perry, Gordon Newfold, just in case any of you are interested. And then I'm also going to be drawing a lot of my own experience, my parenting experience, my therapeutic and my practice experience. And I'm hoping that you're all able to take something really valuable away with you this evening. So are there perfect answers? If you were hopping on here, hoping that I'm going to give you slam dunk all the answers that you need to confidently parent, then I'm afraid I'm not going to give you those answers, but I'm going to hopefully show you something even better. But as we are all so aware, even though we are six months into this thing, there's no manual. And because things are constantly changing, there are no perfect answers. So what is the aim then of this talk if there aren't any answers? Well, my aim is to give you some tools and some encouragement. I just love this. Um, any of you who may follow me on Facebook, you might have seen I actually posted this last night because it's just so relevant and it remains so relevant. Breathe, darling. This is just a chapter, not your whole story. And I think it is so important for us to remember this. It's a long chapter. It's a dark chapter. It's a hard chapter but it is a chapter. It's a chapter in our lives and it's a chapter in our children's lives. And what we need to do is really be able to come up with how do we make the best out of this chapter and how do we make it a chapter that's not just a black hole in our children's lives as well. So who's this talk applicable? My hope is that no matter what age your children are, that you are going to gain something valuable from this talk, that it is applicable for all ages. I'll every now and then be mentioning something that is more applicable for younger children, every now and then be mentioning something that's more applicable for teens. But what you're going to find is a lot of it is even applicable for your own life as well. So welcome 2020. We all began this year and none of us could have imagined that I think we were going to be in quite the space and the place that we are at the moment. It's really been a year that's kind of knocked the blocks out from underneath us. And really, when I saw this visual, I thought this pretty much sums it up, that it has been a year that has felt like absolute chaos so often. It's this big swirly mess and so many days it feels like we're walking on this tightrope. And a friend of mine sent this to me, and I just love Winnie the Pooh, and he's a very wise bear. But this Pooh, yeah, piglet, I'm so tired of this. I am too, piglet. I am too. And that really, for me, sums up so much of what so many of us are feeling, and that's absolute exhaustion. Another friend of mine sent me this, and I thought, wow, this pretty much sums it up. After Monday and Tuesday, even the calendar says WTF. Now, I don't know about you, but I have to like check my diary or check Google Calendar or check my phone to just double check what the date is, what the month is. I remember when I was doing a couple of talks a couple of months ago, it was about, about six weeks ago, I'd advertised a run up to, it was a second talk of the same one because the first one was full and I had totally the wrong month and I posted it. And my sister-in-law, who's also in Cape Town, she messaged me. She said, Gnomes, you put there June. It's actually July. And so we all in this kind of state of battling really to keep up with ourselves. And I'm sure that you can relate to that as well. So just because this has been going on for six months, it doesn't mean it's any less exhausted. And so many of the educators, of the parents, of my friends, of my colleagues that I speak with, this is pretty much this picture sums it up. Absolute exhaustion. So just because we are in lockdown level two, and I think here's the big thing is that we don't, it, it's no less stressful. We think that it should be because we think we should have got the hang of this now, but I'm going to show you now why it remains so stressful and why what's happening within us remains so challenging and difficult. So here's the thing that we need to begin with. We cannot expect our children to be in a space that we are not. And that is critically important to remember. And that's why I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes looking at the space that we collectively are in, ourselves and our children. Because when you understand the space that you're in, you're going to understand the space that your children are in so much better. 
So, you know, the global rates of depression and anxiety, we know from research over this time have skyrocketed. I know from my practice, and it's not only kids and teens and parents, I'm getting messages every single day from people who are just saying, can you help me? I'm depressed or my anxiety has skyrocketed. Most of the psychologists I know, their practices are fully booked at the moment. Mental health is a real challenge. And so what we know, and, and what I'm finding is that a big issue and one of the biggest stumbling blocks that we have that's causing such stress is a word that begins with an e now i want you to guess what it is so i want you to pop into your chat box so as i said please everyone get involved it's going to make such a difference pop into the chat box there's no wrong answers in anything in this talk what do you think this word is this word begins with an e it's a it's a stumbling block for so many of us it's the reason so many people globally are having a hard time energy Emotions, electronics, emotions, all of the above are true. Keep going. Let's have a few more options. So emotions, yeah, because as we're going to see, our emotions are all over, the t all over the place. We are exhausted. Electronics have taken over. And look, Zoom fatigue is real. Expectations. Okay. So all of those are absolutely spot on. The one that I want to focus, though, was there. And that is the word expectations. And as I'm going to show you now, our expectations, given psychologically where we're at in the space that we are at, and that is normal for us to be in, our expectations are very wrong. And part of being able to manage this pandemic and helping our children through it is reassessing our expectations. So I found this, this picture and I thought, wow, doesn't this just sum it up beautifully? What is normal? Well, normal is on its head. It has been on its head for so long. So yes, we've been going on this for months, but your normal, I'm 43. So my normal for 43 years was completely different to what it has been the last six months. However old you are, your normal for that length of time is completely different to what it's been. Normal as we've always known it has been on its head and we feel safe in the known. So let's just look at expectations. Now, if I said to you, I want you just to look at these pictures. These were obviously in World War, World War II. There were air raids going on. What would your expectations, now there's missiles dropping all around here. What would your expectations be of this family trying to get into this shelter here? So what would your expectations, pop in one word, two word. Again, there's no wrong answer. And I'm loving all this interaction already, by the way. Thank you. It's going to make such a difference to, to the evening. So safety, survival. Yes, safety. Survival, security, safety, protection. Okay, so pretty much we would be along those lines. Okay, yes, I'm sure they felt fearful, but we would expect them to be safe. We would expect survival. This is what we would have. We would not expect that mom to have a spick and span house. We would not, we would completely understand if she got to the end of her parenting day and had yelled at the kids. We would understand if things were not done exactly as they should have done. We would understand if every one of her 20 to-do lists, things on the to-do list or on the dad's to-do list was not done. We would understand. Yet, let's have a look at it. We know, now let's look at our current situation. Let's look at who we are and let's look at what your expectations of yourself in this pandemic are and of your children. We know, and the terms have been used time and time again over the last few months, that our world is at war. You know, we've seen in various countries how numbers have decreased and then that there's been a second wave and lockdown has come into place again or a high level has come into place. We know that the world is at war. Just because we cannot see those missiles, that doesn't mean that they are not huge threats and dangers, whether we are consciously aware of them all the time or not. You see, part of the stress that's been created in us is that we are desperately hankering after a sense of normality in an attempt to reduce our stress. Yet, when we really look at the situation for what it is, we can't have normal right now because our world is at war. And just like your expectations, my expectations of those people going into that bomb shelter of their children would not be the same. We would have compassion and we would understand that their sole role would be physical and emotional survival. We have to apply those same expectations for ourselves in this situation. And here's why. Because our pandemic will, yeah, we may not have those missiles, but our pandemic world poses even more psychological challenges than what it did 
in the Second World War than what the world did then. And I'm going to explain to you why. And as I said, you know, yes, we are thankfully seeing a little bit of a reduction in the numbers. And we hope and we pray that we keep seeing that. But in the back of our minds, and we are also seeing what if, what about that second wave? We've got all sorts of other stresses as well in our country. So let's just have a look at this. What kind of things, let's pop on into the chat box again, what kind of things over the last few months, and really this is about absolute honesty too, and it, it's such a stress release when we can all just be honest with one another because we've all been through the same thing. What kind of things have caused stress for you in your life, or what do you think have been some of the really stressful factors over the last few months? Pop it into that chat box. Let's have a look. What are some of those factors? Isolation from friends, fear mongering, okay? The unknown, very much so, the uncertainty, retrenchment, less support, not seeing family, juggling expected responsibilities, the loss of a job, job insecurity, uncertainty. Yeah, that's a huge one. Increased work stress, pay cuts, managing work, home, and family, 100%, all of the above. So absolutely, death, irresponsible behavior, Yes, and as you're going to see that we're going to kind of touch on and I'm going to bring all of these up, but these are very real stresses. And can you see that very tough with little kids? Absolutely, crime. So there's all these things that have been constant stresses and in the back of our minds all the time. And what we know is that we've very much been in a situation where, yes, we have all been confronted as we do in situations like this when there are pandemics, when people that we know, that we see, are, people are dying. We are faced with our own mortality. It is human nature to feel that sense of mortality. And also, we have faced separation. We have faced loss. And what do we know about stress? Stress doesn't only happen when an actual event occurs. It doesn't only happen when there are pay cuts. It doesn't only happen when there is a job loss. It doesn't only happen when there is a loss when someone does die, when someone does get sick, it doesn't only happen then. It happens, stress occurs with the anticipation of these things. So for every single one of us, those things that you've said there and just the anticipation, the fear of those things causes stress. We know that this is happening in human nature. And here's the other thing. Stress triggers what we call primal emotions within us. So big emotions like anger, fear, frustration, anxiety, Irritability, those are primal emotions within us. And I'm going to, to show you just a little bit about them because they're so important for us to recognize. But what I want to know, and usually I don't get too, too many answers for this one, but have any of you not felt any of those over the last six months to any degree? Have any of you not felt any slight anger, slight irritability, slight stress, slight frustration, slight anxiety, slight fear, anyone at all? If you haven't, pop a no into that chat box. Because most of us, all of us, have to some degree felt them. And that's why there are no no's right there. Because these are normal emotional responses in times of stress. And here's the thing. That during times of stress, our brains are so smart. They were built. They gear our bodies up for one thing only during times of stress. And that is to survive. That's it, nothing else. So during this time of stress, our brains have done what they needed to do, and that is to gear our bodies up for stress. And I'm not going to go into the brain. If you are interested in what's happening in your brain and what's happening in your child's brain and how to parent understanding what happens in the brain stem in times of stress in the limbic, it's fascinating. And how we help our children through that, then please send me an email and I'll send you a link um, to this talk that I did on that. We're not going to go into it in detail for the sake of time. But what's happening is really just that that's what's happening in our brain. It's gearing our bodies up. But here's the thing. The more we pressure ourselves to be normal, when circumstances and our brains are telling us that things are not normal, the more stress we're going to feel. And therefore, the more frustration, the more annoyance, the more guilt, and the more depression. And just because lockdown has eased, it doesn't mean that these things aren't applied. It's I almost feel, and I, I've, the, the amount of requests for help in anxiety and depression haven't eased off with the lockdown, not at all. In fact, they might even, I would think, possibly even have got more.
the stresses remain there, the threats remain there. And the fact that the threat is invisible, but still exists. And the fact now that we're all aware that lockdown is eased so that they, and, and that yes, there are people being irresponsible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that causes more stress. But we're pressuring ourselves to be normal when circumstances on our brain are saying, no, that's increasing our stress even further. Now, what I want us to look at, and you're gonna see the relevance, how this all ties in now. I want you to look at these four pictures here. I want you to pop into the chat box. What do you notice that is the same about these four pictures? There are a few things that are the same. What do you think? What can you see that's the same? Pop it in. There's a crowd. What else? They're getting together. They're together. They're grouped. There's group mentality, community. Similar groups, they're sticking together, safety in a group, they're all group, the team, you are all spot on. Thank you, loving the interaction. So here's the thing. Now we know from research that when mammals are stressed, if you put stressed mammals in an enclosure, what do they do? They group together. Stressed mammals group together, why? Because they are stronger together. So our mammalian brains are wired that we are stronger together and we are safer together. Why does that happen? Well, that is, this is all stuff that's been hardwired into our brains from birth. We know that an attachment, because of the attachment relationship, so attachment is really the neurological connections, the bonds that are forming between a caregiver and a child. It doesn't have to be a mother, it can be any caregiver. So, that, so the neurological networks are forming when a caregiver is able to see to a child's physical and emotional needs. That attachment forms the basis for every part of our lives. And one of them, so for relationships, for, um, it's for so much, anything that happens further on is all attachment based. But one of the very important things is that's also happening with attachment is our brains are being wired that safety is togetherness. So in our human brains, the answer to reducing all stress is togetherness. So have a look at what happens. But before we actually get to, to the real crux of this all, just think in terms of extreme stress, when those raw primal emotions are, figured, are, are triggered, when there's fear, anxiety, anger, um, frustration, helplessness, who do we seek? So when you, if you had to step out of a burning building or a car accident, who would be the first person that you would ask for, the first people that you would seek? What would, you, what would your response be? Pop it into that chat box. Your mom, mm-hmm, mom and hubby, yep, the son, hubby, husband, parents, husband, family, absolutely right, your wife, your mom, okay, your daughter, God, husband, okay, so do you see that what we can see there, and, and this is the same reason, your answers there is the same reason why we know from a psychological perspective, when you remove a child from a trauma situation, the first step is actually not to say, okay, I'm removing you to a safe place. Why? Because safety is family. Safety is togetherness. So one of the first things we do when we remove a child from any kind of trauma situation is to put them with their family before there's any debriefing of any sort. Because most often as humans when, humans, when we come out of a trauma situation, we want family, we want our parents, we want our spouses, we want our children. We want to know that they're okay and we want them with us because that reduces our stress. Now, the amazing thing is, is that attachment relations even transcends death. So if you've had a strong attachment relationship with anyone, they still represent a sense of safety to you. Now, my mom died 24 years ago, yet in the first two months of this pandemic, who was I longing for? I was longing for and missing my mother. Why? Because in my mind, my brain is hardwired that she represents safety. That is how strong 
attachment relationships are. Now, this is pretty much a given, but if I show you these two pictures, who feels safer here? Is it this guy on his own or is it this group of people together? The answer is self-explanatory. We feel stress when togetherness is threatened. Okay, so, so we know that this group of people feel safer. But here's the thing. Here is the amazing thing that we have to remember. When I said that this pandemic has a greater psychological impact on us than the World War II air raids and what, what those families were going through in World War II, this is why. We feel stress when together, togetherness is threatened, okay, as animals do, as has been the case. Our togetherness has been threatened. But here's the thing. As Gordon Neufeld says, I absolutely love this. We are in the perfect emotional storm. Why? The perfect emotional storm, I get goosebumps saying this, is not when togetherness is threatened. But it is. But it's not when togetherness is threatened. It's when togetherness is the threat. Because we know that in our pandemic situation, being together, just being together, whether it's conscious or unconscious, is a threat of the trans transmission of the virus. So togetherness is the threat. So the essence of everything that we as humans are about, that we are hardwired to be about, is threatened. And it's important that we understand ourselves and our children in this context so that we know how to best transition through this and move through this pandemic. So togetherness calms us down, yet now it has the potential to be life-threatening. I mean, we know even now that we can spend time with families, that we can spend time with our, our in-laws, our parents, our parents in-law, other family members, um, obviously with restrictions in place. At the back of our mind, I mean, I know we went to go and visit my, my kids, um, my husband's parents the other day with my kids for the first time since March, and we still have to. Maintain social distance, remember to have your masks on. Um, that The kind of things that we still, because obviously they're elderly, um, my husband's father is very ill. So those kind of things. So, so there's still that threat. So lockdown level two hasn't changed the invisible threat and it hasn't reduced the degree of stress. And for our children, as I'm going to show you later, it hasn't either. But what we need to do is in the context of what I've just spoken to you about, we can understand this raging, what we've been called, I don't know if any of you, I'm sure you have heard that beautiful term that describes this so perfectly, this Corona coaster within this context. So this is just a meme, I love it. One day you're loving your bubble, going for walks, baking cakes and pottering around the garden. And the next you're crying, drinking wine for breakfast, eating party rings and missing people you don't even like. Now, even with the lockdown level two, we're still going to have, okay, and we can understand this corona coaster in terms of if you look at what happens in stress, the neurochemicals that are, are produced in our brains are adrenaline and cortisol. Our bodies need those for survival. But what it also does is it can create these emotional waves of up and down. And what I like to call PDs. So everyone I know, myself included, has had a lot of PDs over the last few months and is still having them from time to time. Now in psychological terms, we talk about a PD in terms of a personality disorder, but I don't mean we've all been having personality disorders. What I mean is, pandemic days. So I call these days pandemic days. I actually admit I haven't had a pandemic day in a long time. On Sunday, I just had a pandemic day. What are pandemic days? It's days you wake up, you can't put your finger on it, but you're just not feeling okay. You just feel a bit more down than usual. And they're a normal part of what we're going through. And everyone I've spoken to, whether it's been a colleague or a friend or clients or patients of mine, we're having pandemic days. I'm sure you can relate in terms of having these yourself. So in our stress response, when we release these primal emotions, the thing about them is we cannot suppress them. These huge, big emotions are powerful. That anger, that frustration, they need an out. And I'm going to get to an, a, an, a, what kind of out they need closer to the end. But what we need to remember now is that they need to be expressed safely. Because here's the problem. If we don't find a way to express the anger, the frustration, the stress properly, this is what we're going to see, is that we end up outing these on people in our families, on our closest, our nearest and dearest, and our children. And what the problem is, is that when we out them, so when there is the shouting, the rage, the frustration, what it causes is disconnection in relationships. Any time there is, and what you're going to see with a disconnection, the problem is, is that now when there's any trauma, the one thing that we need, so the one thing we need to be working on is connection. 
for ourselves and for our children. But when we are, those primal emotions don't find an appropriate out, they come out in shouting and frustration and irritability and rage with our children, and that causes disconnection. So parenting through the pandemic, and here is the crux of it, and there's no way around it, and I'm gonna mention it at the end of the, as well, is self work. Self is the most important. And I'm gonna read this twice because it, it, we just cannot, we cannot escape this. I cannot give to my children that which I do not possess or cannot give to myself. I cannot give to my children that which I do not possess or cannot give to myself. So we have to begin with where we are at. And that's why I wanted to really explain the emotional situation that we're all finding ourselves in and that we've been through and are going through and will likely keep going through to some degree for quite a while to come because you have to understand yourself before you can help your children through this. So you know what the real jolt for me is, and, you'll find, and a lot of people are talking about this, and what you'll find is with any global pandemic, with any event in history, in terms of that's been in the past, with any world war, there's been an A and a B. And just like that, there's an A and a B here. There was a before COVID, and there will be an after COVID. But here's the thing, and this for me was like, when I really thought about it, I was like, oh, because the before COVID is not going to be the same as the after COVID. We will never again have life exactly like it was. Never again. We know this. History has told us this. Researchers have told us this. Life is, is going to change. It has changed, as we know. It is changing. But what do you, when I say life is never going to be the same, what kind of emotions come up for you? I'm saying to you, life is never, and, and look, life wasn't exactly, we all know, there were problems, there were issues with life, we all wanted things to change, but what comes up for you when I say, life is never going to be exactly like it was? Loss, fear, sadness, fear, opportunity, yeah, fear, more thoughts, scared, hope, Okay, change. There's going to be change. So, yes, and okay, angry. Okay, absolutely. Why not? Okay, maybe, all right, because we know, and Lisa, we know that, and this is, of course, what, what researchers have told us we know, look how much has changed already. That every world war that we've had, every pandemic that we've had, things are not good. We know that the world has already shifted hugely online, that because of our crashing in economies, that because so much has changed in terms of healthcare, in terms of we can hope that things will be better. We hope that, we pray that, we don't know. But what we do know is that life as we've known it, exactly as we've known it, is going to change. Now, when I really first thought about this, and I read about the research relating to this, etc., what I felt was sadness. And all of what you'd put there is absolutely right. And remember all those big feelings, even the anger, it's all a part of this. When we talk about sadness, it's in, we're talking about in terms of, and the word that's also come up for so many people has been the word grief. Because there was a normal as we knew it, and that normal isn't there, that normal has changed. It's kind of become this new normal that, that it's, a, it's a new for now normal. And we don't know what's going to come in the future, but things have changed. So the sense of sadness, but here is the thing. And here's the importance of allowing ourselves to feel sad is we underestimate the importance of sadness. So often a big emotion like sadness comes along and what do we want to do? It doesn't sit comfortably with us. We don't like those big emotions. So we want to shift them away. We want to just walk on by. We want to say, oh, no, that's uncomfortable. Let's just push them aside. But if we do that, we are missing out on the opportunity actually to move forward. It's critical to allow ourselves to move forward to, so that we actually feel the sadness first. And this is why. Let, let me explain this why in terms of. So an emotional shift in the sad, sadness allows an emotional shift. And allows us to move away from these primal emotions. So we need to be using things like, as we're going to see, creative problem solving, like looking ahead, like so many of you said there, opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. That can't happen, even from what's happening in the brain, until we've actually allowed ourselves to really feel the loss of what we had. So let me take my little one of my nuggets, for example. 
and we see we see meltdowns with kids, with teens, with adults. We see them all over. Let's take at the beginning of lockdown. So right at the beginning, we had had at the beginning of the 2020. My husband had planned this holiday for us this year. Like he he told us about it. I was like, no ways, no ways. This just sounds too amazing to be true. It can't happen. So it was going to be my kids' first airplane ride. It was it flight. It was they had got their little backpacks. The time was coming. We had our countdown worm going. Then all of a sudden, pandemic hit. Schools closed, so all the restrictions. This they were very aware of this virus out there. We told them that we wouldn't be going on our holiday, they wouldn't be going on their plane trip. So there was a whole lot happening. And I remember one night she absolutely melted down in the dining room. And I just sat there. And as we know with what meltdowns, whether it's in ourselves or our children, we see it, it's like this wave. We know that it, there's like this crescendo going up, and there's like this peak, and we have to sit in that peak. We have to sit alongside our children in that peak, but then it tips. And what happens thereafter is this absolute sadness. And then she shifted after all the, the flushing about and around. And then she just sat on my lap and she sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. And in that, there was connection. And in that, we could move forward. But those emotions had to have the out of the sadness before we could move forward. I remember, so I told you my mom died 24 years ago. She had was diagnosed with cancer when I was 13. She died when I was 19. I remember as a teenager being so angry with her. And some days I would just be so angry. I want to emotionally just push her away. In her wisdom, she would just stand there and know that when I'd gone over that wave, I would just melt down and sob in her arms. And in that, we could move forward together. In that there was connection and we could move forward together. Sadness is so important. And as I said, all these big emotions as adults, often we wanna just shoot them out, scoot them out the way. They're important to acknowledge within ourselves, allow within ourselves and sit with our children in them. So the most important consideration during this whole pandemic, no matter what level lockdown we are, is connection and maintaining togetherness, even though we can't be together as we've known it in the past. We have to allow ourselves to be washed with sadness before we can actually shift into that creative problem solving space to be able to do this, to be able to figure out how to connect, how to move to, how to maintain the togetherness, even though we are apart. So for now, I'm going to jump back to those primal emotions at the end. But for now, I want us just to think of a few other critically important things in terms of parenting. The first thing I'm, well, first I want to say the most important aspect of any part of your parenting, what is it? And whether it's parenting in the pandemic, Okay, so thank you, Lisa, for that. Yeah, that your children won't experience the closeness. Yeah, that's a very real fear. So, okay, so what is the most important aspect of any part of your parenting, right? Okay, affection. What else is important? Love, okay. Keep going. Let's go. What is it? Presence, yes, very important. I'm going to touch on that. And whether it's pandemic parenting, by the way, or any parenting, the parenting course I'm busy doing at the moment, I see, we seem to get back to this point every single session. Open communication, safe space for your kids, grounding. And you can, understanding your children's stress, support, yes, 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 yes. The thing is, you cannot have any of those. And they're all absolutely spot on. They're all absolutely right. You can't have any of those if you're not considering one thing. And here's the thing. The most important aspect of any part of your parenting is you. And here's the thing, and I find I say this so often, I actually said it to someone else today as well. The thing about the ironic thing about parenting is it actually has very little to do with our children. It has a huge amount to do with us and the space that we're in and all those awesome things you popped in the chat box right now. We can't do any of those if we're not first looking at ourselves. So this tool that I'm going to show you now is probably the most, it, it, it's the tool I use the most in parenting. I think that when we can practice using this tool, remember with practice, anything is a habit. This is also a habit. The more we use this, the more valuable you're going to find it and the more it's going to make a change to your parenting. Um, and that is what I call the wand. Now, you know, when you were, I didn't know that it was called wand until last year sometime I was doing a, a parenting talk um, and, and one of the dads in the, I, I called it the thing about, and, and one of the dads kindly told me, no, it's actually called a security one. You know, when you walk through that airport and you walk through and that scanner goes beep, 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 beep. And then the security guard takes out that wand 
and wands you. And if you've ever heard any of my previous talks, I tend to talk about the wand often because it's just so amazingly useful as a tool for parenting, no matter what age your kids are. And really what it is, so you walk through that and they scan you and they tell you. Now, the wand in, our par in terms of parenting is that often something will happen with our children. There will be a meltdown. There will be an incident. There will be a behavior issue. There will be something. And what we do is we react to it very much, and I'm going to give you an example now, based on our emotional space instead of to the actual situation at hand. What our children need, especially during this time, because remember what I said, what we need is connection, remembering that any reaction causes a disconnection. So the thing we don't need during trauma. When we can wand, and all a wand is, is checking, okay, what is going on within myself that could possibly be aggravating how I'm going to react to the situation. So when we can recognize that and say, oh, okay, I didn't get much sleep last night. And this all happens in a split second, by the way. I don't get much sleep last night. I don't know what's happening here um, with the screen. I didn't get much sleep last night. I'm feeling stressed about work, whatever it might be. So when you can recognize those things within yourself, um, you will find that you then respond completely differently to your children. Let me give you an example. What so, so I remember it was a couple of weeks ago, but as I said, I use this every single day. I had just done a, I'd spent five hours doing a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation, and I left my screen. And of course, the pandemic brain, I probably hadn't saved. Um, I left my screen to go and have a late lunch with my family. I came back. My computer screen was gray black. Now, I think you know where I'm going with this. It is never a good thing when you look at your computer screen and it's gray black. And I thought, Whoo, okay, I pressed the on button again and it kind of came to life. And I prayed that my presentation that I spent five hours working on would still be there. Of course it wasn't. Now in my telling my husband about this, the kids came around and they were in my office. They were going, Oh, what's wrong? And they were just kids being kids. They were being kids being kids next to my desk. Now within me, of course, I've lost my presentation. I'm, I'm thinking, oh my word, I'm going to be up till two o'clock in the morning reading this presentation. What is happening within me? I wanted to say to them, get out of my office. Why? And I didn't. Why? Because I quickly did that scan. And I said, Naomi, you are stressed. You are exhausted. You've lost a five hour presentation. Just, and in that I could just breathe and I could recognize it was my stuff. And because I could do that, I could say to them, guys, mom is feeling very irritated right now and frustrated. Can you please go out my office while I sort this out? And in doing that, as they walked out, they did go out the office, they got it. And my son, who's an empath, he's seven, he said to me, mom, I'm so sorry you lost your presentation. Now, if I had shouted at them, it would have disconnected. But because I could do that wonder and recognize, it didn't happen. Michelle, can I please ask you just to check? I think it might be um, your mouse that's created that line on the, so I've made Michelle co-host, just checking we, while we've got lines across our screen here. So, so important that that wand. So communicate your own emotions to your children without passing the blame. When I said, I am feeling irritable, you see what we usually do with our children is we go, guys, you're making me feel angry, frustrated. And actually it's not them at all. It's our own space. No one can make us feel this, feel what we're feeling. It's our own emotional space. Um, so it's not about what they're making us feel. And in doing that, it gives our children permission to feel. So by us telling them how we feel, it gives them permission to feel too. So many houses end up, kids end up becoming adults who are depressed why? Because they never knew that they were allowed to feel because emotions were always squashed. We've got to normalize those primal emotions um, and talk lots about, about these emotions that we're feeling openly. We're feeling a lot of emotions at the moment. So patience is critically important. I realized the day before lockdown, actually, that patience was going to be the most essential parenting attribute that I could have. Because man alive, our patience has been tested just because of our own frustration that we're in. So we've got to be taking a lot of deep breaths. The other thing to always remember when your child behaves in any way or your teen, ask yourself why. Why are they behaving that way? Put yourself in your child's shoes in the context of what they're going through in terms of stress and attachment. Listen to them. Children do not feel heard. You know, we do a lot of talking as adults. We don't listen enough. Remember that 80%, we know when we're meeting someone, 
for the first time. 80% of what the information that we're getting from them is nonverbal. It's the same with our children. We need to be making spaces for our kids to talk. Spaces, times like dinner time. If you don't eat around the table with your children, I encourage you to change that and to do that. Or breakfast time or some time when you can sit together as a family because there's unbelievably important information you're going to get about your child's emotional space when, you, when you're all sitting together. Sometimes when something's really not okay with your child, dinner time is going to be, or your team, especially your team, dinner time is going to be the first place that you actually pick it up. If you've got a sensitive child, make space for them to talk. Ask them, have you got any questions? Maybe that's night time. Remember, teens sometimes don't like looking straight into your eyes. A lot of kids don't. Sometimes asking and having those deep conversations with our kids is that side-by-side -side time that we have with them. So one of the number one thing that teens and preteens feel is misunderstood and unheard. They need parents who they know understand them. And here's the other thing that we tend to do because it's human nature. We try to fix. It's human nature to fix. Our kids don't need fixing. They need us to just be able to listen to them. So before you jump in, and we can't fix in this pandemic. It is what it is. We can't fix. So what you need to do is just let them feel understood. And remember that behavior is driven by relationship. Here's the thing. Behavior is driven by relationship. So if that's the first place we always look when our children are struggling in their behaviors is actually the relationship. So is your child feeling heard in this very difficult time? We need to talk, talk, talk. Don't stop talking. Remember that it's in other times that big connection happens. So often it's not just the times when we're talking about issues. It's in times when we are. And I hope you're making space. Play games. Just a reminder to make sure your mics are on mute. Play games with your kids. Um, do other things. Go out, have a picnic in the garden. Play Uno. Watch a ser series together. Do things with them because it's in those times, I find whether it's in my practice or whether I'm with my kids, it's in the other times that the big stuff comes out. Let your teen, your teens have had a really hard time. If you have teens, this has been an unbelievably hard time for them because why? Teens know who they are because of their space within their social circle and they haven't had that and it's been shifted completely. So we need to give our teens space to still have a voice in our home, to still have big conversations, our teens, political conversations, moral, ethical. What do you think about what's happening in the economy? What do you think about what's, what's happened? Where's all the money got? Those kind of questions. Remember, you don't have to agree with them but it's important that they feel heard. With our little kids, we obviously want to keep talking to them about what's going on on their level. Remember the other thing is that there is safety in the sames. So a lot has changed. I want you just to pop in your chat box so we can all just get back together again and regroup after these last few slides. What kind of things are the same? So much has changed. And the other thing is, is that there's changes every week. I mean, whether it's the bottle store opening or closing, there's schools that have been opening and closing, there's changes to the lockdown, there's changes to the economy. What things in all of these changes have stayed the same? And why it's so important, thank you, why it's so important um, is that our kids feel, we all feel safety in the same. So the home life is the same, routine is the same, family time is the same. Yes, these things are the same. And so we are focusing, there's so much focus on different. Our kids are weird. They're going to school now. They've got masks. They've got social distancing. There's so much that has changed. It's so important that they remember and that you talk about the things that are still the same. And remember parents, that your relationship is what keeps that, you are the lighthouse. So the steers are very stormy. They are likely to be stormy for a while, but the relationship that you have with them changed. And your, your relationship is their lighthouse. And that's a, that's a big, that is why your focus through all of this, the only thing that you should focus on is relationship. And then remember this, the circle of control. And this is something that I use within myself. I teach it too. I talk about it with my own kids and I use it with a lot. I use it with the educators I work with. I use it with a lot of the kids and the teens that I work with too. Some, I mean, I know, I call it the pandemic rain. The brain that you just, your mind races and keeps, I mean, I felt like I have ADHD over the last few months. It's a constant bringing in of, and it's because of just the stress and all the busyness and the things that are going on. It's a raining and I'm very, very visual thinker. You might have realized that. And I literally picture my thoughts kind of running out of control and then I rein them in 
and I picture the smaller circle. There is so much we cannot control. And our kids often anxiety increases when we are worried about everything that we can't control. So things that we can't control, Corruption. We can't control when schools are going to open and shut. We can't control if there's going to be a second wave. We cannot control what other people do. We cannot control watching how other people respond. What can we control? Focus on that. And this for me, as I said, is a breather for myself as well. I've also over the months been so frustrated at what's been happening outside, but it's to rein it in. We can control what we do, our responses, our attitudes, what we eat, even the small things for your kids. Remember, there's such power in small little things of control. What we eat for breakfast, it's the smallest things that you won't even think about, that we don't think about. Focus on those and embrace them with your children. Remember, they're going to ask you questions that you don't have the answer to. And I mean, I know my little, one of mine, mine has asked me so often, um, you know, when is this going to end? The frustration, the fear for him, when is this going to end? And I think the longer this pandemic draws on, the more frustrating it is in terms of when are we going to go back to being just that get together, that social, that closeness, the big play dates, the birthday parties, etc. But here's the awesome thing as parents answers are not as important as the relationship. Isn't that wow? And whether it's for the pandemic or any part in life, and that's why so much of this talk is actually applicable for any part of your parenting. It's not about the answers. The safety is in the relationship. So yes, you want to answer them honestly. We can't guarantee their safety, your safety, but you can make them feel safe through your relationship with them. We know that our kids, our teens are exposed to so much on social media, just through what we discussed. The other thing just to remember is that, especially if you have a more sensitive child, if you have an anxious child, what we do when we're anxious is, I, I like to think about the visual that I get is like ears flapping, like big elephants. We flapping, our kids are flapping to get as much information as they can in an attempt to control their world. Now, I remember that when my son went back to school, it, it was probably about a month ago that they went back now with all these changes. He said to me, mom, why do we have to go back to school when lockdown is even stricter? Now, he didn't mean lockdown is stricter. He meant at the, at the time, the numbers were on the increase. That's what he meant. Now, why? Because he was gathering information. And even though I've made a conscious decision to guard what my husband and I talk about, these things come out on your phone calls with others, on whatever screen time they might have. But remember, it's important they get the accurate information from you age appropriate and that you are aware of the things that are being said. Even if you're saying them to a friend on the phone, three rooms down, your more sensitive child, your more sensitive teen is hearing them. So why does school feel unsafe for children? And remember, there's still, we think, oh, they've been going on it for a long time. Yes, it is getting better. It is getting easier, but it still feels unsafe. Why? Because safety is emotional, not physical. And the relationship for so many of our children is not the same. We know that boys like to rough play. They like to high five. They like elbow each other. Girls like to hug, like to be near. There's a nearness in break with teachers, with educators. There's a nearness. There's a closeness. I literally hug. That's all changed. So for my son, the biggest issue, my son's name is Christian, the hardest thing for him, and we've had to process this a lot, is this not touching. Why? What he's saying is the relationship has changed. It's harder to just recognize that safety in the relationship. Look, our kids are going to be okay. They're going to work this out. But we need to just acknowledge the space that they're in because physical distancing, as we said, goes against their nature. And just because it's old news now for six months in, it doesn't make it less stressful for us, even though we're kind of getting used to it, or for our children. So we don't know what's going to happen with schooling. As I said, we hope and pray things are going to go up and up and we won't land up back in that pandemic schooling. I think we could, maybe some of you are still pandemic schooling due to health issues or personal reasons, whatever it might be. We know that that's a challenge and I'm not going to harp on it today. But what I do want to say is whatever you have to do, whether it's schooling or any other issue, never at the cost of your relationship because your relationship is the one thing that is going to get you through, that is going to get your children through. So if it's a matter of choosing between schooling and the quality of your relationship, you know, so many families were finding during the pandemic schooling. And as I said, keep this in the back of your mind. They were finding that they were end up, the relationship with their children was so bad because they were kind of, they are having to work themselves. They're under stress. They're having to get their kids to work. Never ever at the cost of your relationship. Whatever you have to do, preserve your relationship because schooling you can catch up. Relationship and the potential impact of this world pandemic, this global pandemic, that 
is not going to be as repairable as catching up schoolwork. So yes, routine is important for all of us because we feel safe in the known and the predictable. It's so important. But what's also important, often due to our own anxiety, we tend to be rigid. Seven o'clock bedtime. You know what? If there's a family Zoom quiz night and it goes slightly over, that's okay on a weekend. So what, that's what I'm trying to say is whatever it is, we want routine because our children feel safe in routine. So do we. By the way, if you're feeling quite chaotic, try and implement a small morning routine for yourself. Even if it is, I wake up and I have a cup of tea outside. If that's the only routine you have, because any routine creates a sense of even a greater sense of peace within ourselves. It's the same for our children. Um, you know, the more chaos there is out there, the more safety our children need to feel at home. The more they need to know what is expected of me. You know, there's that beautiful saying to my children, I may not always know what to expect from my children, but my children should always know what to expect from me as a parent. So yes, things have changed, but the expectations in terms of what we have, in terms of the values in our home, of kindness, of, of respect, of whatever your values are, those mustn't change. Because if you change those or you lower those, you're creating un unsafety for your children. So for me, something that's so important to remember in terms of how do we help our children get through this storm and any storm in life, because really we've been thrown into the ocean here, is a sense of rootedness. Even my little logo, there's those leaves in there. For me, that represents a tree because I believe we are all, our children are trees. Our aim as parents is to help them grow those roots as deeply as possible. And one of the ways that we do this is through these sames of things like family traditions, like we have birthday tables, or we have Friday night quiz evenings, we have Friday night burger evenings, we usually have Sunday afternoons family movies, maybe it's a dog walk, maybe it's some kind of a week, maybe it's a Wednesday night games night that you have. Remember there's safety within the context of home. You've got to keep doing these things. These things that are keeping your children rooted now, they're gonna carry to their children and their children. They're critically important. I absolutely love this. Oh, just going back, what kind of, very quickly, any of you got any, um, any things that you do, family routines, just pop them in very quickly, two minutes. What do you do that helps create rootedness in your family in terms of what routines have you got? Do you have a games night? Do you have a movie night? Do you sit at the table? Friday night, movie and pizza. Awesome, Tracy. Okay, no phone rules. Yes, because that's such an important time for connection. Cook a meal together. Wonderful. Friday night movies. Tuesday night quiz, but oh, I love it. I love it. Yes, yes, yes. Fantastic. Keep doing these things because remember to you, they might seem oh, like just simple little things. These are roots for your children that help them to grow. Dog walks, walks on the beach. How awesome. And the, the, so, so what's happening with your children in these times and the connections, it is, and you will never probably know the power of this, but I just love this thing. A tree with strong roots laughs at storms. And this is so true to remember. Your children are not only going to go through this pandemic storm, I'm so sorry to tell you, they are going to go through storms throughout their lives. If they have strong roots, and these are some of the things that are going to create your relationship and things like those, the, the traditions, etc., are what is giving them strong roots and helping them create resilience to get through all the storms in life. The other thing that I find, and this for me is so beneficial as a parent, is to ask ourselves this very important question. Does it really matter? Because moms and dads, here's the thing. So often, things that we are, we, we blow things out of proportion. We make, we, we put so much emphasis on things that, in the greater scheme of things, especially now, don't really matter. The picture that always comes into my heart, in my mind, are muddy feet through the house. Now, whether we think whether it's a dog, your spouse, your children, or whoever it is, muddy feet in the house. Rah! But in the greater scheme of things, what would happen? I see muddy feet. Christian, Rachel, how could you do this? Muddy feet, wipe your feet outside the house, whatever it might be. In the greater scheme of things, what have I done there? I've shouted, I've caused a disconnection. What would be the better thing to do? Wow, guys, muddy feet. Grab that cloth, natural consequence, tidy up. Or now we're going to have to wait for it to dry and sweep it up. Yes, some things might irk us, but always ask yourself the question, is it worth the disconnection that this is going to cause when there is a natural consequence? You know, and this for me is so critical. The little things that we freak out about often don't matter.
But the little things that we do and say and pay attention to often do. Your children doing the little things, you taking your time and paying attention to the little things often do matter hugely because they give your children the message, wow, mom and dad, they really care. They're noticing these little things. And yet the, the things that are often unimportant that we freak about out about cause disconnection. So just rethink what really matters, especially in a time like this. If you've got little ones and you've seen them regress, it's okay. Expect regression. When they're feeling safety enough from an emotional perspective, you'll see them come out of it. Now is not the time to be worrying about the regression that you've seen and leaping in for help. Just be that safe space. They will come out of it. Remember, and this is something that I have been so aware of over the last few weeks. During this pandemic, everything has been magnified. Every issue, I've had so many parents say, you know, they were anxious, it got so much better, and then anxiety, slam bang, when pandemic hit, everything went pear-shaped. Everything in terms of that you're seeing, behavior, and remember behavior is always a message. It's always a message. Our role as parents is to find out exactly what that message is. Anxiety, depression, attention difficulties, sensory processing difficulties, learning challenges, Everything has been, magnif has been magnified. And if you haven't noticed an issue in your child before and you've seen it now, then now during the pandemic is not the time to be diagnosing anything. For example, an attention difficulty, just because, I mean, this isn't, the, there's no time for it now, but if we look at it and understand what's happening in the brain, we expect there to be things like attention difficulties, like difficulty concentrating, like difficulty, for example, doing maths, whatever it might be. We expect those kind of things. So if you're a working parent, and I know you know, I had a conversation today, I was trying to have a phone call with a working parent, and he just kept apologizing. I said, it's okay, because three times he had to say, just, just can you just hold on a second? And he had to redirect his children somewhere else. We know the frustrations. It's better now that most of our kids are at school, but still many of us are having to work from home um, as well, whether it's after hours and we're used to having our kids or not working, having our own workspace. So remember, you can't do it all. Remember those expectations at the beginning. Our expectations are too high and very often completely unrealistic of ourselves and our children. Something's got to give. You're going to have to be flexible. And you've also got to know that other people generally understand. We've heard, all heard stories about people on Zoom meetings where a child has walked in, where a dog has walked in, whatever it might be. Routine in the sense is really important and that you have your own workspace and your children have their own workspace. And yes, expect them to entertain. If you've got littlies, have a box that is purely a box that comes out of toys, of activities, purely when you have a critically important phone call to make or a vitally important email to send or a really essential account that needs to go out. You take that box out only then if you have litties. It works like a bomb and then you put it away again because you're going to find you need that space. And just bottom line, be realistic about that. Now, I want to go back to those primal emotions. Remember I said to you that if we don't, find an out for those primal emotions, they disconnect. And right now we need connection more than anything else. Now, what the Greeks used to do, long before we spoke about play in the terms that we did, look, children have always played, but the Greeks had emotional playgrounds. The more the chaos was out there, the bigger their playgrounds would become and the more they would, they would identify that they needed to play. We all need one, no matter what our age is, because it needs, we need to have this platform for these primal emotions. So what are they? These are, you know, the Greeks used to have their dance and their theater, but we, now, we can have these in any way. Maybe for you, it's just journaling. Maybe it is, I mean, in our families, on a Friday night, every now and then, and we don't do it often enough, but I love it when we do. We've also kind of, over this pandemic, I don't know if any of you have got pandemic theme songs. So we've kind of, one of ours is Dance Monkey. We've always loved Katy Perry's Rule, but we, and Thunder. We put these things on and we blast it in the kitchen or on the patio and we dance and we just kind of let our head out. It's the most also try it if you haven't it's awesome experience um but whether it's the games that you play whether it's music that you play together whether it's arts crafts whether it's dress up dinners i know so many people have done but find an art for you and your children and your family don't think only your children need art you need that emotional playground too because in that your stress is reduced and your primal emotions have an art you know, this is so fascinating, this, and we have to remember this. Pre, this is what research tells us. Pre-pandemic children had higher stress rates 
than those children that were in those World War II bomb raids. Those missiles that were, drop, that were dropping down. Our children pre-pandemic had higher stress rates. Why? Two reasons. Children in the World War II were playing more and they spent more time with their families. Think about life as we know it, as we said, which wasn't always so great before the pandemic. Our children weren't playing as much as it because of the busyness of life. How many of our children weren't playing that much? And because, and the busyness also created a disconnection in families. How often do you kind of just touch base with your child at dinner time? Touch base with your spouse when you kind of flop into bed at night. Oh, hey, yeah, good morning and good night. The busyness of life. And we need to learn from this and we need to take this forward. Our children need, we need more play and we need more family time. And so do our children. Remember that our children process through play. They always have throughout time. I mean, I don't know what your house has looked like over this pandemic. And remember, I'm, I'm talking about young children now, but even our teens, whether where it's them listening to music or whatever it is, my house, every conceivable cupboard in the house has most days been an ICU ward for some kind of a soft toy or animal. If you went to my medicine cupboard right now, you, if you needed a plaster, you probably couldn't find one because it's probably been used on a stuffed toy or animal. Our children process through play. So we don't judge their playing. We don't even question them about their playing. Whatever playing you've seen, wh whoever it's been with, just know that they're processing. They're doing deep work. Um, and that family time is the most important looking at what reduces stress. And even teens, you know, our teens act like, oh, stuff you, I don't want to be with my parents. I just want to be with my, teens need us so much more than we think they do. You remain their safe space. And all the teens that I work with, I know that from them too. But it's so easy to let family time, whether it's family games or dinner time, slip away. Because like it or not, you know, those first few weeks of lockdown, everything slowed down. And a few people have been able to hold on to that slowness, but because of the stress and this rush to get back to normal, I think many of us have slipped back into this pandemic chaos. So we are even more chaotic now than that old normal because we've additionally to trying to keep up with the normal, trying to still generate an income, trying to still work, trying to remember masks, sanitizing, grocery shopping from a distance, sanitizing groceries, whatever it might be. So it's like this pandemic chaos. In that, there is a great risk of losing family time. Make it most important in terms of what's going to reduce everyone's stress. Find ways to turn disempowerment to empowerment. Moms and dads, I can't tell you if there's one thing that empowers any of us, especially your children, during any, this is a time of disempowerment. It's empowerment. Giving them small choices empowers them. I think about what I do in my playroom at any stage with kids. Do you want the green chair or the yellow chair? With my own kids, do you want this or do you want this? Choices empowers make them part of the solution you know our kids we get so frustrated our kids pick up on their frustration why do i have to wear this mask why do we have to social distance why can't we see our friends to remind them they're part of a solution that this is actually how they save the world this is how we help protect lives um and to do other things community projects wow do you know, and I mean, research will also tell us, we know even from what's happening in the brain, but when you are doing something or being proactive and when you've got your children involved in community projects, whether it's we know the SPCAs are needing blankets, whether it's the SPCAs or going online and doing a little online order for an old person that you know at an old age home or painting rocks of hope and putting them in the neighborhood, whatever it might be whether it's your team, get them to organize a quiz night or something, get your children to teach you a skill or a game or chess or something that you don't know. These are empowering things. Turn disempowerment to empowerment. And remember, as we've spoken about, our teens are in that stage of wanting to break free, but they need you. So get normalized with them. Get them to problem solve solutions around not being able to have massive birthday parties, not being able to socialize in big groups. The first step for any of our kids is always to feel understood. Now, I quickly want to show you this, and I'm going to show you a very small, short piece of it. I posted it online about probably about six weeks ago. I started it. And um, so this is one way. We know from trauma research, and Bruce Perry, who is an incredible psychiatrist, and just so that you know, we've, we've got about five minutes left, so bear with me. Um, he's an incredible psychiatrist who does a lot of work with trauma. We know from research that we can get through any trauma. Our children can process any trauma. So can we, if we can make sense of our story. There's, how do we make sense of the story? Because if we don't help our children make sense of the story of the pandemic that we're in, it is likely it can, it has, it stands the huge risk of them growing older with this blob of, this black blob of time in their lives that was just this 
this depressing, this pandemic. If they can make sense of it, it will be, it, can, it has the potential to be a memory that they will pass on to their children and their children's children. So whatever you might journal, you might do posts on it, you might write up about it, you might have a family project, but in some way, help your children make sense of their story. Now I'll show you something, a very short piece of what I did. This is an ongoing thing that I'm working on with my family. We've taken photos, 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 and I've put them into, I used an app called InShot um, that you can download for free. Just, and we've plugged it all in. What we did as a family, what, happened what went on when things happened and as i said this is gonna it's likely to be a two-hour thing in the end um and you can put in your your pandemic music my final version is probably gonna be um with dance sure Dun dance monkey will be a part of it so but think of a way that you can help your children make sense of their story So as I said, this is a, this goes on and it's going to keep going on. I used this. So the program was in shot. You get a lot. You will probably know more than I do. You get a lot of free ones. And it's such fun. My kids love this and they want to watch it over and over and over. Just keep plugging it in. But whatever you do, there's a million creative things that you could be doing. Do something with this time that this wasn't just the dark 2020 pandemic, that this was a time that they will remember, that they will have grown from, and that they can remember the connection that happened, the changes that happened, the lessons that they learned, because like it or not, we've all learned lessons, and so have our children. Oh, sorry about that. There we go. You know, very quickly, the power of gratitude. Remember, the space that you're in as a parent sets the stage for the space that everyone is in your family for the whole day. We know from research that gratitude even increase, improves our immune system. It, it can relieve depression. It relieves anger. There's so much positivity about it. How do we do this? Notice the little things in your children. What do they do? I think my empath son, he's so often on the little walks that they've been in, he's brought me back a flower. My daughter who is a live wire and has pajama days, something that I've taken to do over this lockdown period is on weekends, I, I just walk around the garden with my camera and noticing the little thing. Start your day off with one thing that you're grateful for because it changes the whole tone. In terms of what's happening on a neurochemistry level in your brain, it changes that too. Self-care, as I said in the beginning, this is the most important thing. If this is all you take away with you, then do that. Self-care without guilt. Make time for it, whether it's a coffee in a car with, with a friend. I know that over this lockdown period, I've often had like coffee, a friend of mine sat in a, a car next to me in a parking lot, we'd had coffee, or whether it's open air picnic. Remember, your emotional space sets the tone. Calm is contagious in your family. So make self-care a priority. You see, in the chaos, we often don't. The, the thing that I also think is critical to us being okay through this pandemic is mental flexibility. Things are changing all the time. I know, I don't know what things are like in, in your schools down there, but in Maritzburg schools, especially in our government schools, schools are open, then they're closed. Then there's a positive case, so they're closed for cleaning. So it's constant changing all the time. From day to day, we, we kind of, is there another announcement being made tonight? What, I mean, and I don't know if this is true, so no one get so no one get get antsy when I say this. But someone told me earlier today, well, bottle stores are closing again. So I'm sure it's I, I have no I cannot vouch for that. But what I'm trying to say is that don't all jump on trying to do online orders quickly. But things are changing all the time, and if we are dead set on them, the more fixed we are, the more rigid we are, the more disappointed we are, and the more we actually it it, it sets us up for anxiety and depression. Resilience is the ability to be mentally flexible. We have literally got to take this day by day. We can't have also any expectations of our emotional space or our children's. We've got to focus on just being in the space that we're in, whether it's a pandemic day, whatever the world throws at us, just be at it without judging it. Just some extra bits. Stop and pay attention for a moment. You know, that's all your kids also want to take two breaths and notice what they're doing. Also, it's so easy to get into this negative cycle with our kids, with ourselves, what's going on in the world. Stop and focus. What's going well? What's going well with your child, with your team, within yourself? 
just focus on that. And what your children really need right now, remember they're not getting all that extra affection and that physical from their friends at school, from other family members necessarily, they need it from you and give them your presence. What I find during this pandemic, and this is, a, I mean, look, this isn't me parenting expert here telling you how to do it. I'm a very real parent who has the same challenges as you do. One of the biggest struggles for me in the pandemic chaos and distress has been mindful presence because my mind is always wanting to race away with me. And it's been about drawing in and knowing right now, let me just breathe and focus on the right here, the right now. What are my children saying and doing? What do they need in this moment? So to focus on that, remember resilience isn't those big things. It's built in the small moments of togetherness, whether they're loud and messy or quiet and still. It's built, resilience is built in just being with our children. So our closing thoughts, feel sad. If that sadness comes, if those primal emotions come, give them an out, don't squash them. If the sadness comes, feel it. Remember, emotions are a wave. Our, aim, our point is not to judge them. We can't judge them. We've got to just roll with them. I'm sure some of you are surfers. Just go with it. Sit in it. It will pass, but feel it because we have to feel sad to move on. Allow those pandemic days. On Sunday, when I had a pandemic day, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't shake myself. I, I tried. I tried all the techniques. I couldn't. I just had to be compassionate and know that the wave would move. I knew on Monday I would feel better. I knew that Sunday was just going to be a not okay day. And that was okay because I understood that I also could reflect on it within myself and didn't take it out on my family members. Reflect to your children how hard and frustrating it is. Because it is, as I said right in the beginning, just because we've been going on and this is six months, it doesn't make it any easier. It remains frustrating. Every time I bring groceries back, and I, I, I do, I, I'm one of those, I sanitize my groceries. Some of you may do, some of you may not. But I think, oh, the frustration of having to sanitize when you go into the shop, to sanitize the trolley. It is for us all these things, the hardships for our kids of schools, of going to school, of having to wear masks, of all that they have to do. Give your kids that understanding, let them know. And in the same breath, have that compassion for yourself. You know what my son said to me a while ago, we've also, and, and this made me realize, so when in school drop-offs, I don't know what the drop-off is at your school, but there's kind of these lines for the, the little kids. You can walk them up to the classroom. And my daughter, she's in grade double R. My son is in grade one. The older ones from grade one on, you have to kind of park in rows. They get out and they have to walk up by themselves. But because I've got my little one, he can now also walk up halfway with him with me. And you know, he said to me the other day, he said, mom, please, can, can I just walk up with you? It's easier for my heart. So there are things, and that drop-off for him, I mean, who, for different, uh, for our kids, because of their different natures, different parts of this pandemic are going to be harder. Maybe for your child, it's the social aspect. You ne we need to find out from them, what's the hardest? And is there a way that we can make it easier in our power and with the restrictions that we have? But be open to hearing that. So I want to say to you tonight, rethink your expectations of yourself and of your children, because as we've seen, it's impossible for us to be having those same expectations. Reach out. If you are struggling, you're not alone. If you need extra support, as I said, every single day, I am getting messages. My colleagues are getting messages. The world, our mental health, because it is normal in states like this for our mental health to be struggling. Reach out to a psychologist in your area. Most psychologists are working online at the moment. So reach out and get the help that you need. I don't have all the answers. I don't. We're all on this journey of which we don't always have the answers and we don't know how it's going to end. We don't know how this journey is going to end. We don't know when it's going to end. But here's the thing, my aim in this talk, as I said in the beginning, it actually wasn't just to give you the tools and encouragement, it was also to give you the faith that all the answers that you need in this pandemic lie within yourself. I've got some really good news is that actually you don't have to have all the answers because the answer to all the questions about confidently parenting, both in this pandemic and in any other time in your life is in one word only. I want you just to think what is that do you think that word is what do you think that one word is the answer to the questions about confidently parenting through the pandemic lies in one word only what do you think that is what word are we gonna guess where's your answer come on take a guess you guys have been awesome in terms of your interaction there's no wrong answers yet 
Okay, patience, yes, confidence, charm. Okay, so we all, Lindy, in you, in you. So all those things are important. Patience is critical. Let's have a look at the answer. And here's the great news for you. The answer to all your pandemic questions and any parenting questions that you're always going to have is in the relationship. It's in relationship. It's in you because you, of course, as parent, have the potential and it's in your hands to create that relationship with your child. Is this not just awesome? It gives me goosebumps, even though I know this and I work with this stuff all the time. It gives me goosebumps every time I think about it because the answer, whatever happens, I'll fall back to any time you don't have an answer to a question. The answers in your relationship. Let that be your fallback. The stronger your relationship is with your children, the more okay they're going to be. And here's the thing. I've got more goosebumps. Healing from this perfect emotional storm, the healing is in the parent-child relationship. We're in this massive storm that we still feel some days like we're drowning in. But the healing's in the relationship. Isn't that not the most incredible news? Safety is a space, it's not a place. And the space is created by you, mom, and by you, dad. That's where your child's safety lies. That's where your teen's safety lies. So thank you so much for spending this evening with me, your Tuesday evening. It has been so awesome to just share this with you. And I really hope that you have been able to, to gain something of value from it. Um, again, apologies for the red line. I have no idea where that came from. I wasn't touching anything at the time. Thank you for putting up with it. Um, these things happen. Um, but thank you so much. And what I will do is I will edit the recording um, beginning and end, and then I will send it through to Michelle um, to send to you. Thanks, Jody, Nicole. And yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, guys. And thanks for being so interactive because it makes such a difference hosting when, um, thanks, Tracy. Thanks. Thank you so much. So it makes such a difference. You guys have been a great audience and I've really appreciated it. So have a good evening and all the best. Um, thanks, Mila. All the best as you continue in this. <laughs>